So uh, my name is Frank Notaft. I'm a uh, PhD student at the UC Berkeley AMP Lab. Uh, I'll be talking today about some of the work we've been doing with the Atom project and a recent recompute effort to go ahead and validate Atom on a large uh, multi-hundred terabyte data set of genomic data. Uh, if you're interested in this slide, you have any comments about it, please feel free to tweet at me. Uh, my Twitter handle is at fnotaft, if you're interested. So uh, I've been beaten to the punch with this slide. Uh, you may have seen this already today. I, I refer to it as a compulsory Moore's Law slide because for those of you who aren't in the bioinformatics industry, you go to any bioinformatics conference and you see this at least 10 times a day. Um, so as the speaker before, before me hit on, you know, one of the great things that's going on in genomics right now is that we have, you know, the cost of sequencing is plummeting. You know, so we've made a lot of innovations on the wet lab side of, uh, you know, of genomics and we've been able to drop the cost of, you know, of sequencing a single human genome from multiple hundreds of millions of dollars down to about a thousand dollars today. Uh, and this has allowed us to go ahead and run increasingly larger and larger uh, projects that are trying to get at the root of what causes, you know, these diverse traits to cause, uh, to show up. So, you know, we start with the human genome project. We built the reference genome for the, you know, so we have the average human genome. We went ahead, we ran the thousand genomes project. So that gave us what human genome variation looks like across, you know, a, somewhat representative pool of a hundred of a thousand people and then we ran TCGA which is this much larger project uh, looking specifically at cancer where we actually collected three petabytes of genomic data so very cool you know cost of sequencing is dropping amount of data that we're acquiring is greatly increasing but we're not keeping analysis costs falling at the same point in time you know like you, you see Moore's law kind of tracking there at the top of the slide Moore's law is not falling anywhere near as fast as our data analysis costs are, are going and so, me, myself, I work on the variant analysis problem. So, uh, you know, I work on going from raw, raw sequence reads to genomic variants. And to, the way to think of this is that, you know, let's say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, take famous literature. You know, your, your genome looks more or less like a long, very long string, 3.2 billion bases long. I'm going to take that and I'm going to shred it up and then I'm going to try to go ahead and reconstruct it. So, uh, you know, the way to think of the sequencing process itself is that it's, it's more or less a Poisson substring sampling process. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to, uh, you know, generate, in our case, we're talking about Illumina data, so it's fixed length reads, and I'm going to generate them at some sort of kind of Poisson distribution where my, you know, my uh, Poisson constant is going to be determined by the amount of replication that I want to have, so the depth that I'm sequencing at. When we talk about, you know, the $1,000 genome, we're saying that for $1,000 we can get 30 reads at every site in your genome. Uh, to go ahead and take this $1,000 uh, $1, worth of uh, wet lab data, though, and turn it into actual, you know, variants that we can do something with, we need about $400 of uh, compute that comes after this. And what this compute looks like, you know, we talked a little bit about this earlier. We're going to go ahead, we're going to align the sequences back. So we don't know where in the genome a sequence came from, we just have the sequence. So we put it back, uh, align it against the, this uh, genome reference. And then we go ahead and we put the sequence back together by, you know, looking for what, what the, you know, kind of doing a majority voting process you can think. It's more complicated than that. We have a bunch of biases and errors that we want to keep in. Uh, you know, we have, we have variants at about one in every 1,000 places in the genome, but the reads that we get actually have errors at one in every 50 bases. So this, uh, this sequence reassembly process is kind of string editing, kind of statistics, um, but eventually this gets us to our bag of edits against the genome. And the process looks a lot like this. You know, this is kind of what our end-to-end -end variant analysis process looks like if we went ahead and we took it and composed it into a bunch of uh, computational steps. And this specific pipeline that I'm showing you is the GATK practice, uh, best practices pipeline that the speaker in the previous talk talked about paralyzing. And, uh, you know, there, there's two big areas in this pipeline that I like to think processing step. So here we're going to take your sequence, we're going to align it against the human genome, and then we're going to do this process where we clean up errors in the raw reads. So we're still just working with these read fragments. This process takes about 150 hours of compute time per sample if I look at a 65x genome. So this uh, 60x is probably the benchmark for what we'd use in clinical practice, uh, you know, starting at 30, going up to 60, going even higher than that in some cases, like if I'm, if I'm working with, uh, you know, cancer data, I may go higher. So this, you know, 150 hours per sample. Then finally, when I go to this, to this process where I'm just generating the diffs, you know, I'm just doing the text diff, you know, the statistical process where I take the reads, turn them into my variants. This is about one week per thousand samples right now. So this is a very expensive process. And, you know, if I'm going to go ahead and scale things up, 
this computational, this computational section is, is actually starting to outpace my wet lab costs. You know, if I'm going to run a uh, project where I'm going to sequence 100,000 genomes, I can expect to spend about, you know, $100 million, um, you know, going ahead doing the sequencing, $40 million doing a single analysis pass. Uh, most large process, uh, most large sequencing projects don't do a single analysis path. You know, if we look at the 1,000 Genomes Project, they have gone through four separate analysis passes. So that would mean that they're, at that point, spending at least one and a half x their wet lab costs just on computational stuff. So, uh, you know, this is a, a big risk factor for genomics moving forward. And, uh, you know, from my side, I'm actually not, I'm not a biologist. I'm not a geneticist. I'm just a computer systems person. And the, the big thing that, that shocked me when I came to, came to the genomics world it's just that you see how much of genomics is built around these legacy tools, these flattened file formats that constrain the way that we go ahead and we process our data. Um, so, you know, we, we've kind of briefly mentioned some of these formats before, but, uh, you know, one of these big, very common formats is this BAM file format. It's a binary file format for representing how a genomic sequence has been aligned to the reference genome. Uh, it's, it's pretty efficient, gets good compression, um, but it fundamentally has a lot of analysis constraints baked in. So it's, it's optimized so that the finest granularity of data I can pull out of the file is a whole read with all of the metadata associated to it. The only predicate that I can evaluate on this file is a predicate where I read a section of the reference genome. And to do this, I actually have to sort my file and index it a very specific way. As a result, the way that we have built all of our tools in genomics is around having a sorted iterator across the genome, and we're just going to write every single analysis we have against this sorted iterator. And, uh, you know, for many of you who are sitting out there in the audience, you know, you may think, okay, you know, let's say I was going to go ahead and write a simple, simple experiment. I want to I look at all of my reads, and whenever I have a read and I align it, I get a probability score that goes along with it. You know, how, how good how well did I put this read in the correct position? Let's say I just want to run a, a really quick analysis like to see, oh, you know, what's the spectrum of the qualities that I have for all of the reads that I've gone ahead and I've, I've aligned? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to crawl over my sorted iterator. I'm going to read every single, every single read in there to extract one integer. So that's clearly not the most efficient way to do things. And you're kind of, you know, I hope that you're kind of latching onto this trend right now that, you know, these flat architectures are exposing these really weird bad programming interfaces that we're locked into. You know, we're locked into this sorted iterator model. This gives us actually a variety of, you know, a variety of problems that crop up. You know, one, if, if I'm going to go ahead and write against this, I have to think of how my algorithm goes ahead and maps to this. So this seems trivial if I'm going to do some simple algorithm, but, you know, we talked extensively about duplicate marking in the last talk. Uh, what, when I'm doing this duplicate marking, really what I'm doing is I'm grouping all of the reads by the original sequence fragment that they came from. So, you know, in, in Illumina, you know, typically one sequence fragment generates two reads. This is just an implementation detail. Um, it's a very useful implementation detail, don't get me wrong, but I have to go ahead and I regroup my reads by what original fragment of DNA they came from. Then I do a group by position. So when I go ahead and rewrite this against a sorted iterator, I have to go ahead and figure out how to express these two group bys as something I can easily do against a sorted iterator. And it turns out, if you look at the, the Picard source code, the Picard source code actually does this incorrectly. Um, so there are certain things in Picard where you cannot correctly mark a pair of reads as duplicate, even if it is a duplicated pair of reads, because you are writing your code against this sorted iterator. Uh, there are other places in the, in the GATK where they, you know, this isn't the only algorithm that they get wrong because of this sorted iterator constraint. So, you know, we wind up having this, this abstraction that's difficult to program against, that causes us to make weird bugs, and that limits the way that we can optimize the code that we're writing. So we said, okay, you know, we're going we're gonna to start Greenfield here. You know, we're just going to go ahead, we're going to throw away these binary file formats, we're just going to start with a schema. And, you know, for those of us who kind of come from the systems database, uh, database world, schemas are great because once we have a schema, we have this narrow waist. You know, like we said, okay, you know, as long as you can give me a schema, if I can transform my data, you know, like however it's stored into my schema, I'm good. If I can take my schema and move it over to a different programming, you know, programming interface, then I'm good. You know, I can modify how I'm working with my data. I can modify how I'm storing my data 
excellent. On top of this, we've gone ahead and we've done a lot of work to accelerate common queries. So, you know, we were talking, uh, you know, talking a lot in the last two, two talks about how a lot of the queries that we have in genomics, you know, well, we, we have this sorted order that we're relying on because a lot of our queries are based on, you know, looking at a specific position in the genome. And, uh, you know, for me wearing my database hat, you know, that's cool, but the way that I want to express that is some sort of an aggregate or some sort of a join that is optimized for doing, uh, you know, for doing this join in a coordinate space or doing an aggregate at a single position in a coordinate space. I don't want to go ahead and, and write my code against a sorted iterator. I want to write it as this higher level function. So we've gone ahead in the Atom, in the Atom code base. Atom's a system, it's, you can think of it as a Spark-based library for doing genomic analyses. We, we expose a bunch of, you know, common schemas, a bunch of common Spark-based primitives so you can paralyze your genomic analysis task. And, you know, one of the big core things that we've built in, and it shows up in pretty much all of the genomic algorithms that we write, is this really performant, fast overlap join. But this isn't the only thing that you can go ahead and do with it. You know, if you want to go ahead and write a lot of these queries that don't rely on joins, uh, you know, like we talked about this duplicate marking algorithm earlier, duplicate marking maps really simply to one of these aggregation patterns. Um, so, you know, if I paralyze something via the aggregation pattern, if I paralyze it via a join pattern, we get really great horizontal scalability. So um, these are some numbers that they're a little bit old. We've gone ahead and gotten about a 50% performance improvement over the last year over these numbers. We're in the process of running a large validation right now to kind of go ahead and update this slide. But we did a bunch of scale tests where we compared Atom on a single node uh, running a bunch of these common steps. So we took four steps from the GATK um, pipeline that we were just discussing in the previous talk. We also took a, uh, a step that's a very low latency quality control um, step from another, from another pipeline. So this is just looking at the quality of your data before you're going to do any of these big analysis tests. We ran it both on a single node, uh, you know, Spark versus all of the other single node optimized tools, as well as scaling this out. We ran all of these experiments in the uh, EC2 cloud. So the single node was a large node. It was a IS or an I2.8x large. This is uh, IO optimized. Then the single nodes were fairly small, so they were R3.2x large, which is a memory optimized configuration. Even on a single node, we found that Atom in many cases would get up to a three, uh, you know, a three x performance improvement over the uh, legacy genomics tools. When we went ahead and we scaled out, we would see that you know starting from that three x improvement we would get an additional 30 to 50x speed up over these tools. Um, the speed up actually goes ahead and extends very far out. We've done a variety of tests on smaller files that have indicated that our parallelism is in most cases limited to, uh, you know, well, it'll extend linearly out as long as we have 16 megabytes of data per core. So the file that I'm experimenting on here, this is this NA1278 genome. Uh, those of you who are familiar, uh, you know, familiar with genomics will, will have heard of NA12878 before. For those of you who aren't, this is a very, very standard, very well-studied genome that we like to characterize against. Um, this file itself is 240 gigabytes compressed. It's about 600 gigabytes uncompressed. Um, you know, that when we go ahead and we speed up to, you know, uh, just kind of going off that limitation, that gives us about speed up being limited to about 4,096 cores. Uh, well, we can still achieve linear speed up out to 4,096 cores. Uh, we'll still get some diminishing returns after that. Uh, you will see that there is one, uh, one algorithm in this plot that doesn't achieve linear speed out all the way out. Uh, here we're going up to 1,024 cores. This one algorithm is that quality control algorithm that I had uh, expressed earlier. The reason that it doesn't go ahead and achieve speed out going all the way out is its performance is so fast on a single node that it winds up being scheduler limited when we scale out. So on a single node, it takes about six minutes uh, as compared to a lot of the other algorithms where we're looking at, you know, tens to twenties of hours. The other cool thing that we get from this, you know, as I said, one of, the, you know, one of the reasons that we love stacks in computer science is that we can swap everything out. You know, if I want to go ahead and instead of optimizing for large-scale batch processing, let's say I want to run some interactive rollups on my genome. You know, let's say I'm somebody who wants to explore a bag of variants that is in a patient who I want to see in a clinic. Well, you know, let's say I have a very large collection of variants that I want to go ahead and push down some query. I want to do some rollups on. I only want to do rollups on a single, single interesting location in the genome. 
Uh, so we're borrowing heavily from some work that's been done previously uh, at the AMP lab, and that's also been kind of rolled out in the Spark to, to do indexed RDDs. That you know, it's essentially an RDD that's accelerated for point lookups. So we went ahead and you know, point lookups aren't actually very useful in genomics. You really want range lookups. There are very few things in genomics that are actually points. You know, even the things that look like points really are ranges. Looking at them as points actually makes some very bad simplifications. So we went ahead and we extended this, uh, this point-optimized RDD for range queries. Uh, we, can, we can essentially swap the traditional RDD implementation out for this, this uh, interval RDD. Then if I want to go ahead and run interactive queries against this, I can get really awesome latencies, you know, like latencies in, in the less than 150 millisecond range. So we have a, another project that builds on top of Atom called Mango uh, that's working on a genome uh, visualization and roll-up tool uh, so look for, look for that coming up soon. But the, the big thing that I did want to talk about today, and uh, a criticism that was levied against Adam in an earlier talk, was that Adam hasn't been validated on genomic data. And uh, I would question that assertion since we've done exact read-to-read -read concordance tests between the GATT-K and Adam pipelines in previous papers that have illustrated that we're concordant on uh, all but 500 or all but 5,000 out of 1.4 billion reads. But uh, we're running a very large validation project of Atom right now where we're validating Atom against the GATK best practices tools. Um, so we're doing this study on the Simons Genome Diversity Project, which is a really interesting data set that just got released uh, about two months ago. So it's a data set with 260 individuals. Uh, these 260 individuals represent 127 different ethnic groups. Uh, so the goal with this project is to get a sense for, you know, what variation is common across different, um, you know, different geographic regions in the world uh, to, you know, just try to have a better catalog of, uh, of human genomic variation. You know, when we look at a lot of the previous genomic studies that have been done, they've tended to focus on, uh, you know, not, I wouldn't say homogenous populations, but they've been somewhat limiting if you're looking at people who aren't necessarily, um, you know, Central Europeans who have resettled in, uh, in Utah, for example, is a common, common very well-studied pedigree. So this, this is aiming to study more people than just the common people we've already genotyped. Uh, we're running this on top of a workflow management tool called TOIL. I'll speak about TOIL in a second. But the, you know, the peak scale that we're hitting in this experiment will be running on more than 1,000 uh, R3.8x large instances on the AWS cloud, running all of these in, spot, uh, in a spot configuration. And uh, so just to kind of like talk about how we're actually running this pipeline, so we're running the pipeline itself using Toil. So Toil is a pipeline, uh, pipeline manager for these massive workflows. It's uh, out of this, uh, you know, it's a collaboration between us and UC Santa Cruz, the BD2K center, so it's big data to knowledge for the NIH. Uh, it's a very scalable system that you know, we've run it already on up to 32,000 cores. And it, it, it uh, relies on a lot of the same principles as Spark, but for, you know, for single node workflows. So, you know, we get resumable failure by looking at lineage. Um, it provides us a lot of very nice portability things. We can go ahead, pull it over to Amazon, OpenStack, Azure, in-house HPC installs. We're working on Google Cloud support. Um, and it's a very simple API built in Python. And really what Toil is, um, it, you know, and I'll just throw out two words that don't really mean anything and then, then expound on that. So Toil is a DAG meta scheduler. So uh, when I say it's a DAG meta scheduler, what, what is this DAG? So this DAG is our workflow. So we, we go ahead and we build a directed acyclic graph that shows how computation flows in our system. So, you know, maybe to pop back to a, one of the earlier pipelines, you know, we align our reads that, you know, that goes ahead and spins off, you know, I go ahead and I sort my reads, then I recalibrate, or, you know, maybe I mark my duplicates and I do some further cleanup, then I call my variants, and that's kind of what my DAG looks like. And if I have many different samples or I have pipelines that fork off, then I, I wind up getting very interesting tree-like structures. So here a job is just a Python function or a class, or it can be even, you know, there are several standard workflow languages that we support. A uh, common one is the common workflow description. So, you know, a job is just a single node, a single task being run. Uh, when I say Toil is a meta scheduler, Toil actually goes ahead and runs this job by delegating to a subscheduler. So if you're running Mesos on your cluster, you're running Yarn on your cluster, 
what Toil will do is it will submit a job to, you know, to Mesos. It'll ask for, res uh, for resources. It'll give a command line. Mesos will actually run that. Toil will interact with Mesos to check the schedule or uh, to check the status of the job. Uh, on top of this, we also have some, some support for persistence, for writing files, for communicating between jobs, for sharing promised data. Um, but really, the big thing that's nice with Toil is it supports a bunch of different underlying schedulers, a bunch of different underlying job stores. So if I want to go ahead and run a workflow on, you know, let's say on Microsoft Azure, running you know, with Azure Data Lake as my backing persistent store and running with Mesos as my scheduler, and then later take it and move it over to my in-house cluster running you know, LSF with, you know, like uh, let's say I'm running Ceph because I'm an HPC person, or you know, in my case, maybe my in-house cluster is running Yarn plus HDFS, I can take my workflow, I can port it to all of these different environments, and I don't have to rewrite my code. So that's very useful. The other thing, if I'm running in the cloud, is Toil will actually let me auto-scale the cluster that I'm running on. So you know, commonly in our workflows, we have a single stage that can't use, you know, you know, maybe it can only use a single machine. We have later stages in our pipeline that can use, say, 8 or 10 or 20, 50, 100 machines. Toil can go ahead and increase the number of machines that we have at any point in time so we can actually saturate, well, you know, that we can make sure that we're using all the machines that we have. And this happens transparently to the jobs that are running. Uh, how does this look for Spark? Um, one big hint is that a cluster, you know, like Spark is a cluster-based service, Cluster is just a collection of single node jobs that all have a tied fate. So in, uh, in Toil, when we run a Spark cluster, it just looks like one of these, uh, what we call a service jobs, where we say, okay, you know, I'm going start to start a Spark master, I'm going to connect a bunch of Spark workers, and I want these to live as long as the job that is running Spark lives. So uh, we go ahead, we start up the service cluster, uh, we run our Atom-based workflows that connect to the Spark cluster, and uh, that lets us run Spark in this in this very nice reproducible workflow system. As for doing a, uh, an evaluation, so we've, uh, you know, we've gone ahead and we've done just read-to-read -read, uh, read -read concordance evaluations previously. Uh, this, this evaluation is looking exactly at the variant concordance. So we've done a, a fair bit of uh, concordance analysis so far that you know, shows that we're essentially statistically equivalent. Um, the way to think of this is that in the, in the genomes that we're looking at, you get about 10 million variants called per genome. Uh, we differ against the GATK best practices pipeline at about 5,000 of those 10 million sites. So it's concordance of uh, about 99.5%. Uh, as for the performance of our pipeline, the read preprocessing portion is about 30x faster and 3x cheaper. These numbers are, uh, are actually not even pushing the, the scale that Adam can hit. Here we're just running on a cluster of eight R3.8x large instances in uh, Amazon. So this is a, a fairly limited deployment. The big reason that we're only going at this scale is because of a uh, little knit in Amazon where you are charged the full hour for any fractional hour that you consume. So this winds up being uh, you know, the lowest cost configuration just because of Amazon billing uh, you know, artifacts. So we can go much fast. You know, we can go much wider, and there are actually reasons that you would want to if you're using a spot instance. Uh, you know, big thing to think about is that the lower lower latency, like the less time that a job is running, the less likely it is that it's going to be preempted. Uh, I leave that thought with you. But uh, so we're in the process of recalling the Simon's Genome Diversity Project right now. That's the 260 sample, 100 terabyte data set I was talking about. Uh, our pipeline works on both HG19, GRCH38. There's one big caveat with this. So we're relying on the haplotype caller, which is a GATK block at the end. So we, uh, the GATK haplotype caller winds up taking about 30-something hours to run. So this reduces our end-to-end -end latency to 3.5x. Uh, it's a 3.5x improvement instead of that nice 30x figure. We are working on a replacement for the haplotype caller. We hope to release that towards the uh, middle of the summer, end of the, end of the year this year, sometime in the back half this year, essentially. Um, but we will have a uh, manuscript on this detailing our study coming out hopefully in the next two months, so by the end of the summer. So stay posted for that. Uh, if the work that I talked about to you uh, interests you at all today, all of our work is Apache 2 open source. So if you're interested in checking out the code, uh, you can find Adam there on, on GitHub at bigdatagenomics slash Adam. If you're interested more so in playing around with this code, getting it up to, up to speed and running quickly, you don't feel like going to the repository, checking out, building the source, 
Uh, we recently did a demo working with some people at Databricks. Uh, you can actually take this demo and even better run it on your laptop in the uh, Databricks Community Edition. So that'll get you up and running in less than 30 seconds. Uh, so just take that link, paste it in, you'll be good to go on some sample data. Um, I'd also like to thank many of my colleagues on this. Um, Atom is not the work of a single person. Uh, rather, it's a very large community effort. We have uh, over 52 people who have contributed to the Atom code base from more than 12 institutions, as well as 23 people who have contributed to the TOIL co uh, code base from five different institutions. So thank you very much for your time. I'd be glad to take any questions. Great talk. All right, questions? Please say your name and where you're from. Hi, uh, Tigran Antonian from Capital One Labs. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, seems like a very good tool. Thank you. Thank you for working on this. I just had a quick question about the uh, the comparison part. Uh, mm -hmm. You said that it's basically a string diff, but I know that there are quite a few algorithms to to in fact uh, compare the uh, the segments of the genome. Is is there any specific algorithm that you guys use, or this is outside of the scope of this talk? Um, so the, there is a specific algorithm that we, well, there's actually a set of different specific algorithms that we use. So the algorithm that we use right now is this haplotype caller algorithm that does a pairwise alignment of reads against the sequence to go ahead and reconstruct what the exact difference was. And then it runs a statistical kernel on top of it to test all of these different pairwise alignments. Uh, we have the algorithm that we're working on is in a tool called Avocado. It's similar to this, but it actually, instead of doing the pairwise string alignment, it relies on a graph theoretic technique that has um, some different very nice things that you can prove about it that has very different runtime bounds as well. So that's, that's kind of ongoing research, though. We don't have a, uh, we don't have a demonstration of it yet today. Yeah. We have proofs, but no demonstration. Great. Other questions? All right, let's give Frank a big hand. <laughs>